for uh, jo- joining me this week. It's the end of July, 2017. This is the 15th week we've uh, done this podcast. I really appreciate you guys making making it a success and tuning in. Um, for those of you who are new, I uh, sort of recap what I looked at and did in finance and investing for the week and uh, show you uh, the portfolio that I'm managing. So, pretty slow week uh, other than earnings. Earnings are pretty good across the board. Not a lot to look at. Um, I like to, as I mentioned a few times, look at the cap structure of global finance, starting with the least risky, uh, which is supposed to be the TED spread. And the TED spread is behaving normally. And then you look at short dated bonds like uh, uh, the two year bond, uh, you know, certainly LIBOR uh, is sort of in between the TED spread, closer to the TED spread than anything else is the three month LIBOR. Then you look at uh, long dated bonds, and then you look at corporate bonds, and, and certainly then you finally look at the SP yield, earnings yield, and you can see that they're in a stair step ladder one, two, three, four, five percent. So everything's behaving pretty normally. Uh, Bitcoin's at record highs. Um, It's sort of its own animal, obviously. But uh, I guess one thing that's sort of interesting is um, internet stocks uh, all had pretty good earnings, but they stopped going up. And uh, to me, that's an interesting tea leaf, for sure. You know, uh, Netflix went up, obviously, but we'll talk about internet uh, earnings shortly, or tech earnings. but uh, yeah, not a whole lot going on uh, in the world, so pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I noticed that LIBOR is going to be RIP soon, so thanks, Peter, for pointing that out. It's going to be, going to be interesting. All right, so a lot of earnings. Uh, this is probably the biggest earnings week of the year, or four times a year at least. And I listened to probably a dozen or two phone uh, conference calls. Um, most importantly, uh, Alexion had a huge quarter. So the fake news people at Bloomberg should be uh, embarrassed. Uh, for any of you who or forgot or don't know, when this this was when the Alexion news came out, um, and uh, it was a cover of Business Week, which is owned by Bloomberg, um, and the stock went to even went a little bit under a hundred briefly. We made it our largest investment, and now just a, a month or two later, it's at one hundred and thirty, one hundred and thirty-five. So. Fake news can be very profitable uh, if you know how to trade around it. So awesome uh, situation, Alexion. I did sell, as you see in the portfolio, about half the Alexion. Um, Roche is making their own C5 antibodies. So as you may know, Solaris is basically Alexion's only product, and um, it's a C5 antibody. So now Roche, a very big company, is making their own C5 antibody. Now, what does that mean? You might, uh, a novice might think uh, that that's a really bad news. You know, you've got Roche coming in and they're gonna destroy Alexion. But I honestly think it's good news. Um, and it's not the reason I'm selling Alexion. I'm selling Alexion because the stock's gone up a lot really quickly after we bought it. And um, and I'm, I sold half of it, so keep that in mind. But I actually think it's good news because Roche thinks that they should invest in a C5 antibody and um, it could be a big enough market for the two of them. And I think that's actually a pretty good pretty good thing. Amgen had a very block quarter, but Repatha had a good quarter. And my guess is that drug will end up doing a few billion. I don't know what I've got for it in my model. Let me take a look. But there's definitely some upside. I've got to get into three billion. So, uh, and not too much upside in Amgen, even with three billion. Now it could certainly get to, it could do more, you never know. Um, pretty much anyone uh, who has high cholesterol should be on this drug. So, you know, maybe it could get to five or six billion. It could be Amgen's biggest drug. So, something to keep in mind there. Um, Repath is starting to show some signs of life. Uh, Roche reported uh, their new uh, antibody Ocrevus, which is just basically a CD20 um, like Rituxan, had a really big quarter. Merck had a ginormous quarter for Keytruda, and I think they have equaled. Um, Optivo at this point. Um, Humira is uh, from Abbey, also another kind of insane performance. Everyone, every quarter of Abbey's, you have to ask yourself, um, when is it going to stop? Because it's such a such a ridiculous kind of thing. It might become a twenty billion dollar drug, which would certainly be its the largest drug our industry has ever seen. 
and, and may continue. Now, of course, eventually Humira is going to disappear uh, with biosimilars, with drugs like um, Stellara and others, uh, Cosentix, um, you know, sort of uh, showing up. Trimphia is another one um, that'll all eat away eventually at Humira, but it's still kind of a really amazing thing. So GSK reported, I thought it was a pretty good quarter. They've diversified away from Advair pretty substantially. So of their respiratory franchise, Advair is now only two thirds, which uh, may not sound like much, but I don't see a generic Advair coming until that probably drops to around 50%. And the market's sort of assuming way worse. And you've got Tibike and Triumic uh, really crushing numbers now. Bictagravir is coming, so there's a little bit of fear there. But um, we'll see. Now, they also announced they're going to sell a bunch of drugs. I know I'm not buying them, but I wish that um, I knew who was. And it sounded like this was a fait accompli, so maybe I'll reach out to GSK. Let's see if I can grab some other medicines before somebody else does. Celgene reported another huge quarter. Now, what's interesting about Celgene, and it's near 52 week highs, is I actually think that um, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And this has become, you know, really the big biotech darling, 100 billion market cap. Um, Revlimid now doing $8 billion in revenue. I don't think it has much IP. Um, most of those sales are now U.S. That used to be a different split. And so I think that's pretty interesting because once that patent goes, um, that drug will, will drop uh, pretty dramatically as opposed to the rest of the world dynamic. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of, I'm skeptical of Celgene. Um, I'm looking for a reason to short it. I'm not short it, but it's sort of interesting. Buyers becoming a, a crop company. Uh, their Monsanto murder is coming. They actually, it ironically, had a terrible crop quarter themselves, so that's kind of interesting. Bristol Myers and Lily had pretty non-eventful quarters. Biogen had this amazing Spinraza quarter. Good for them. You know, that drug for spinal muscular atrophy um, looks like it'll be a, a $2 billion or more product. Good for them. Gilead, uh, which is our largest investment, had a fantastic quarter. Again, we've seen this nice value turnaround, both Alexion and Gilead value stocks that we bought and, and are seeing nice gains in, so good for Gilead. Twitter uh, uh, had, a, had a pretty terrible quarter. Happy to see that as a short seller and as a uh, jilted user. Um, and then the tech, the big tech companies were all pretty in line. There's nothing much to say about any of them, even though I searched far and wide to glean some kind of an intellect, intelligent comment that there's nothing there. Again, Twitter, really, really, really bad quarter that uh, is embarrassing. They can't add users. Revenue is, is actually falling, which is somewhat amazing uh, given they're supposed to be a, a high growth tech company. So we'll see. Um, the month uh, is ending or ended. I guess we have one day of trading left in the month. So we'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, really nice uh, performance from us. So if you look at the winners for the month, we had Unicure, we had Spark. We had Alexion, PTC, and Avexis. So we had five of the biggest performers as long. So that's really an incredible result. Now we just shorted Nectar, which I'll tell you about in a second. So this doesn't really count against us, I'd say. So we'll see kind of what happens there. On the loser side, we actually got two of the biggest losers as the short side. So we got seven for seven. And that's why, like I've said last time, we're on this kind of an amazing uh, run. It won't last forever, but it's been an amazing run for the last uh, quarter or so for our little portfolio really incredible returns. Um, won't happen again, I guarantee it. Uh, but we all know what happened with the rest of these stocks. There's nothing really interesting to add to any of these, I don't think. Just taking a quick look. Um, we'll talk about neural stem in a minute. They failed their uh, phase two study for depression, so the stock dropped 71%. I missed that one, too bad for me. We've talked about Elmerol potentially being along on this drop. I know Pulse is something that a lot of people are short. Um, but yeah, not a lot to add. Obviously, AstraZeneca with their PD-1 uh, malaise, which we'll talk about in a minute. But we, we've had this amazing uh, success in our portfolio. Uh, Roche actually look, looks like it could be cheap. So that's a new thought for me uh, there. I moved it from the fairly valued column. I don't have a lot else uh, to add, at least written-wise. There's a lot going on in my head as usual. Um, let's see, so the portfolio had an amazing week. We are just shy of 10%, uh, another strong week up 1%, uh, basically net neutral with a little gross exposure, 46%, so mostly in cash. Uh, let's go down real quick with a sale. Like I said, I sold half the Alexion, so uh, Gilead is now our largest investment. Feeling pretty good about that with their quarter 
Regeneron reports this week. Uh, I, could, I guess I'd say I'm nervous, but you know, I, I like this thing over the long haul. We'll see how um, Dupixent did. I think it did okay, if not pretty well, so we'll see. Uh, Avexis uh, went up uh, quite a bit on the Spinraza results. I think people see that this is going to be a big marketplace um, for gene therapy. Uh, I'm sorry, for, for spinal muscular atrophy. Now, gene therapy uh, in SMA is also popular, so I think Biogen is coming with their own um, gene therapy here, so we have to think about that. But I think uh, Vexus will either be owned by Alexion or some of these companies at some point. Uh, Bristol, I think I'm gonna sell the next week. The thesis has kind of changed. I, you know, I'm not that comfortable with it, I'm gonna move on. I might buy more GSK though, so keep that in mind. My hemophilia companies are all doing really well. Um, Unicure is kind of this left for dead company. Spark is doing well, Sangamo is uh, doing well. I'm so happy to see that. The smaller positions I don't really care about. I did uh, realize that I owned a company called AudioEye. I don't suggest you buy this stock. I'm in the process of selling it. I've sold down probably about half a million dollars worth. I have another million dollars of stock to go. I just kind of forgot I had it. Uh, sorry about that. I've got literal stock certificates hanging around somewhere here. A friend told me to invest in it and I'll be selling it, I think for rough, roughly a break even of what I invested which was around a million or a million and a half dollars. I think I, that's roughly what my cost was. Um, so these smaller positions, I'm sort of looking, looking at to um, figure out what to do there. All right, how about the shorts? Um, let's see, so um, Neurotrope has been falling apart. Um, I added Nectar for the first time. This was a, a pretty cool little um, short. I think this could be a really big short. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. They actually did a deal with Eli Lilly. So we'll sort of see how that's going. Um, Snapchat and Twitter, again, falling apart uh, as we speak. Watching Facebook step on these guys um, uh, pretty, pretty painfully. Um, let's see. Not a whole lot else to add. Acadia is reporting soon. I think they're going to have a bad quarter. So we'll kind of see what happens with, with Acadia. Inside, we learned a little bit about baricitinib. It looks like that drug is uh, dead forever. So, um, lucky break for Inside, I guess. Uh, Ironwood, I'd like to short more of this thing, so I'm going to spend some time thinking about that. So I've got a couple of good short candidates, probably two or three or four good short candidates here that i got to pick up the pace on. One stock I've been looking at shorting, I don't put it in healthcare because it's not in healthcare, it's a tech stock, is, is Tencent. And again, I'm, I'm still kind of... Um, researching it, but basically Tencent is a video game company. And um, the, uh, you know, it's about half video games, I'd say. And it's about a $300 billion um, company, 350, I wanna say. Um, no, no, three, yeah, about 350 enterprise value. And um, they've got WeChat and QQ, which are, you know, Facebook-like properties. But, um, you know, it's something that I've, I've considered. QQ is, is not growing anymore, WeChat is still growing somewhat substantially, so we still have some, some ways to go here, but it's still a gaming company, largely, and I, I'm kind of suspicious that they can keep growing their gaming business. Um, I, I was a games analyst, believe it or not, a long time ago, 10 years ago, and um, I didn't do a great job being, being a games analyst, but I know the space a little bit, and the company's just defied any expectations of what a video game company can do, and um, I really am suspicious that uh, they're, they have any organic or serious, the organic growth that the, that the market thinks they have. And at $350 billion, I'm not sure that they can keep going. Again, in tech, I, when I invest in tech, I invest to sort of learn. And you can see that my positions are, are a little bit smaller. Um, I've got this Weibo short, uh, Tableau, Snapchat, Twitter. So I think I might add a little 10 cent short. Um, just so I, I can learn it, understand it, and pay attention to it better. Notice I have no tech longs, but hopefully that'll change soon. Um, so that's the portfolio. You can always ask me questions about it, um, suggest stocks, what have you. Um, I don't think there's any stocks here that anyone suggested to me. I got Acadia through through a chat room, an internet stock chat room I, I go to, which is kind of neat. Um, I got uh, Neurotrope from uh, one of my coworkers. So, uh, yeah, you know, feel free to, to, to give me some stocks. Um, all right, so what happened in healthcare this week that at least I was paying attention to? Um, obviously, the Merck um, putting out Remicade at a 35% uh, price cut to 
Remicade list price, the J&J drug, um, I think this is pretty incredible because this is the second biosimilar, and I think the first one came at a 15% or 10% discount. So what's kind of amazing is, is you've had two, two generics, in essence, biogenerics, and, and rev, you know, pricing has dropped about 35%, which you don't even see that with small molecules. So that's kind of interesting, um, you, know, uh, to, you know, market dynamics there. So I, I think, you know, if you've been in the industry, biogenerics have been around for about 20 years, but they are finally here. And sometimes there's this phenomenon where you don't pay attention to them until it's kind of too late. And I actually think that, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit harder and faster than people thought, even though it's 20 years in the making. So AstraZeneca reported Mystic, uh, rest in peace, uh, AstraZeneca. Um, it's a pretty bad situation, obviously, um, and was the biggest news by far last week. I don't have anything to add that hasn't been said, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Obviously, Merck and AstraZeneca uh, signed their weird little Imparza deal. I don't quite understand what the heck um, they were really um, doing there, but good luck to those guys. Um, the New England Journal published this ANG PTL3 data. Um, check that out. This was, I think, two weeks ago, but I'd been um, missing my uh, New England Journal. So um, I thought it was pretty interesting. These things could be the next PCSK9, so we'll see. Uh, we had two kind of disappointments. You had the uh, neural stem, which, which I, I wish I got this short. I usually get these kinds of, these kinds of shorts and um, you know, drop from like five or six bucks to a dollar uh, sixty. And this was, uh, I guess this was what, like a hundred, hundred million market cap. So that's probably one of the reasons. But um, uh, this, this company had like an ALS stem cell goop that was their hope and dream. And you can see, I was short this thing a long time ago, um, way back when, um, yeah, around here, this time era. I don't know, I don't recall making much money on it, but um, it's been kind of a crappy little company for a very long time. Um, Lily paid uh, Nectar $150 million for uh, for uh, their drug, uh, their phase one oncology drug. And I actually love it um, when a big pharma buys a, a biotech stock, I'm short. Um, they buy basically the whole program for a small, relatively small upfront check. So this is $150 million. That's not really material to Nectar, right? It's a $3.5 billion company. And they've basically given away the product to Eli Lilly for $150 million. And that basically means that I don't have to worry too much about that product becoming a massive success because the upside is now limited to maybe have a small residual, but in general, they, they've, they've sold off one of their babies for a, a paycheck, uh, which is like a dollar a share. Um, my share's outstanding here. Yeah, do, exactly a dollar a share. So I'm much less concerned now. That, that's basically gone. So they only have a couple of drugs. That's kind of interesting. Um, Alexion dumped Moderna um, in the process of whooping uh, the earnings expectations. They also announced that they were not going to work with Moderna anymore. I actually think Moderna is a short. I wish it were public and I had short it. I'd even short it right now on a private as a private company if anyone wanted to, to do a swap trade or something like that. But I, um, I've been skeptical of Moderna for a very long time. Um, and I'm happy that Alexion uh, dumped them. Now, back when Barisitinib, um, uh, it finally was revealed that, uh, that Eli Lilly's Barisitinib was um, uh, uh, rejected by the FDA because there's some side effects. Now, um, I think it's dead. You know, there are drugs sometimes that, like Galvis where, where um, the FDA just really doesn't like that specific drug. Now, we know that Zelljance is approved by Pfizer for the same medication. Abby is working on one. Galapagos is working on one. So it's kind of interesting um, that Barisitinib is dead. And it'll be interesting to see how the company reacts. I think they're just going to give up on it. Um, but to find uh, pulmonary embolisms and deep vein thrombosis for medicine like this was surprising. And it, it could be a class effect that hurts Pfizer. Um, and pretty interesting to see. It's sort of one of the reasons that Drugs, uh, one of my theories of pharmaceuticals is drugs stick along a little longer than you thought. And if you look at Humira, um, a lot of people thought Zelljance would destroy it. And docs are cautious. They don't want to jump into a drug until they've had years and years of experience. And, and now we learn from Barisitinib, even pre-approval, that there are some issues. So we'll kind of think about that. 
Mitsubishi Tanabe bought Neuroderm for $1.1 billion. This isn't a, a well-known company, but it is a, it is a public company um, in the United States. And it was really interesting. You know, it's a biotech I basically haven't looked at. So um, don't see those too often. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see that transaction. Tech was really interesting. As you guys know, I have a tech startup, software startup here in New York, uh, which we're expanding pretty aggressively. And uh, I've been trying to get up the learning curve in tech. I've actually worked for a bunch of tech hedge funds in the past, so I've always been kind of distantly involved in, in, uh, in tech. So Sprint and Charter uh, may be merging, but apparently Charter doesn't want to do it, so there goes that. Who will be Uber's new CEO has been the, the interesting uh, question. Sheryl Sandberg uh, is one thought people have. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions. Uh, Jeff Immelt, Meg Whitman said she won't do it, so it'll be interesting to see if Uber ever gets a uh, CEO. Apparently they have to get one in the next month or two, so we'll see what happens. So Facebook actually has this, you know, um, internet service in uh, Africa and parts of Asia, and somebody said that they, you know, there was this um, report that stated that uh, that they're, they're actually trampling on net neutrality out there and that it, it's a way for them to extend Facebook services and you can't use Twitter on it or, or or other social media, so it's really this effort to sort of control the narrative in these countries, and it was really a scathing report, which is kind of interesting. Um, so a couple bad pieces of news there, so there's that, and then um, uh, they're making a speaker, which is a little crazy, you know, there's a lot of speakers out there, uh, let's see, Google has one, Amazon of course has many, um, Xiaomi announced that they're going to have a $50 speaker, and that's obviously for, for not for... Um, the US, but it's sort of interesting. Apple has one. So it'll be really interesting to see why Facebook wants to get in the hardware game all of a sudden. Obviously they have Oc Oculus, but again, um, um, just sort of weird messages here. And then obviously there, you know, with the messenger ads from the quarter, uh, people love the Facebook quarter of the stock, um, uh, rose pretty substantially. Um, there's that stock price, great quarter. According to most people, I was a little underwhelmed and, and most of the call was about how they're going to put ads into Messenger, which uh, is sort of an interesting to interesting sort of concept um, that people are a little nervous about how they'll execute. And you know, I think it's an interesting tea leaf that they've kind of run out of room on uh, newsfeed, and they've said that many many times. So we'll see what happens, but it's definitely interesting to watch. Tesla three got launched. Uh, the car. Uh, I'm not a driver. I don't really care about Tesla stock, but it's definitely. Fascinating. Uh, speaking of uh, Mr. Musk, uh, SpaceX got valued at 21 billion, which actually seems pretty reasonable given their business model of sort of taking over two trillion dollars of telecom market cap. Um, that's a pretty good bet um, or hedge on, on telecom. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal about uh, Procter and Gamble shifting some of their digital ad spending. They've been doing this for a while. It'll be interesting to see, um, you know, uh, kind of how that affects the internet ad ecosystem. Amazon has a secret 1492 codename team uh, that's doing healthcare. Uh, it'll be cool to see if they they kind of uh, come up with that. Um, uh, what they'll come up with there, whether it's uh, they get into the pharmacy business or they do telemedicine or, or whatever else. But it tells you that Amazon's not done quite yet. And if they do something in healthcare, which they've totally ignored, and it's 20% of GDP, it'll be fascinating to see what Amazon does uh, with healthcare. The Essential phone is coming. It was delayed a few weeks. It'll be interesting to see that crash and burn. Um, Flash has been deprecated, <laughs> so Adobe is finally deprecating Flash. RIP Flash, RIP Microsoft Paint. Uh, and I think there was another old tech thing that, that's going away. I think maybe the iPod Nano or something. Vicarious is an AI software company I watched pretty carefully. I actually had a small AI effort, just with me and a few friends, um, uh, about a year or two ago, and uh, we were kind of doing a little bit like what, what Vicarious was doing. I know MS Paint was saved. Um, and so, um, you know, it's interesting to see Vicarious raise some money. So that's really it. Um, a couple of quick questions. If you guys have any questions right now, you can you can put them in chat, and I'll, I've got some time to stick around and uh, answer them. But a couple of calls. One of my good friends, uh, the rabbi, uh, IG, uh, I don't want to embarrass him with his full name, uh, asked uh, listening to conference calls versus reading transcripts. So I like to listen to the conference calls because you actually get to you get to in your head you gotta get to meet the people. You even get to know their voices. 
um, even though there are people you, you may never meet. And when you actually meet them, you'll kind of um, get a feeling for, for who they are before you meet them. So you kind of get the personalities down and they're not just names you, you forget. And knowing the names is really important. Um, it's hard to explain. So for a million reasons, I think the listening to the calls is better. Obviously, you, you don't pick up things in the transcript um, that are key. Um, but if I had 80 hours to spend on investing, I would listen to the same conference call three or four times every earning season because you'll miss things. And it's, it's really, really important. So um, that's my opinion. Drew sent me an interesting uh, analysis about correlation in stocks. And correlation um, has kind of uh, broken down. And if this is a predictive factor, I don't think it is. I know that a breakdown of correlation has preceded um, several um, downdrafts in the market. And there's a breakdown of correlation right now. But I, I don't think it's causal. Um, Paul asks, why uh, isn't the sum of an infinite series of cash flows infinite in discounted cash flows? And obviously, it's because the um, uh, late tail, uh, it's an exponential, uh, um, an exponential decline is applied. And, you know, so if you do the, uh, the math real quick, say you had a $10 million growing, uh, I don't know, 2% a year in perpetuity, you can see that at the end there, it's a very, very large number if you take the infinite series. And you might say that any summing, if you sum it, clearly it's an infinity. Microsoft Excel doesn't have the capability to give me an infinite row, but it's, it's, it's infinity. Now, if you have a discount rate, uh, say 10%, the NPV is, is about 100 million, I want to say. Um, well, it's making me out to be a liar. Um, yeah, it's as, as you take it close enough, it'll reach some kind of limit. Um, and so obviously the reason is that the each, each period is discounted. So this is not discounted. This is discounted by uh, 10%. This would be discounted by 10% um, to the second power. This would be discounted by 10% to the third power. And eventually as you get to, to the... Um, to be um, to, to 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 far out series of cash flow, you get zero. So this is the, basically the concept of a limit in calculus. So that should be somewhat obvious. Um, so anyway, that's uh, largely it. All the questions here are not worth my time. Uh, I'm sure some of them are, but uh, most of them are not worth my time. So you can always email me before um, these uh, podcasts start at martin at thoughtpatrol.com. I'm reading The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which I think is one of the best books I've ever read. Um, in court, I've been reading Principles of Statistics, which is just an old, very old statistics, first year book. Um, a lot of people talk about data science. It's basically just statistics, so it's fun to kind of um, refresh my memory. A lot of people don't know I actually minored in literature and statistics, so did a lot of statistics, econometrics types of courses. Um, and uh, there's some stuff in here that's, that's pretty complicated, like Bayesian methods and, and whatnot. But in general, it's, it's sort of a first year course in statistics. Always fun to brush up on things. For me, um, like all other people, I forget things and even sometimes basic things. And I think the way memory, most theorists agree that memory is best reinforced by repeated exposure after intervals of no exposure. And so um, I make it a point to sort of do that. Nature Genetics is one of the best um, journal publications there are, so I, I believe that uh, uh, I've been kind of, I think you can find great new medicines and new ideas for medicines by reading it, um, so I've been getting into that lately. All right, um, so you can email me. I am hiring people to manage my investments um, and help me do some of the work that I explicate here, so you can email me a resume, martin at thoughtpatrol.com, or any questions or whatever. Um, sign up for Godel Systems, my new startup, Godel.Systems, and you can get a, a beta access. So that's about half an hour. I really appreciate uh, you guys watching and making, making this a success. Wish me luck. I get a big uh, binary event of my own. It's not a clinical trial, uh, but a big binary event coming up this week. So wish me luck on that, and I'll see you guys later.